My only disclosure right now is that I work for Perfusion.com as one of their clinical educators uh, and coordinators for their ECMO wing of the company. And I'll get out there and do some clinical stuff, uh, Perfusion-wise and ECMO. I mean, I can't lose my skills. But uh, it's been a nice landing of the airplane, going through that evolution of neonates and then pediatrics and then adults many years later, um, and watching it grow and evolve. And certainly I was with uh, the ELSA organization for uh, the ELSA liaison for I think 14, 15 years between AMSEC and ELSO. So that was kind of a nice landing spot too because I was kind of bringing Perfusion and uh, ECMO uh, ELSO together. And uh, it, there were some obstacles there. There were a lot of, you know, a lot of tough, tough little turf battles and all that kind of stuff, but we made it through it. In fact, we had the AMSEC pediatric and ELSO had combined meetings for a number of years, every other year for a while. So it worked out beautifully. And, and as we know, many of us in here as perfusionists, ECMO specialists, are now more involved with ECMO whether we wanted to be or not. Or you may be here because you want to know more about it because maybe you're hearing something from management that we are going to be involved soon. So we did this in the beginning before everybody goes in the room. Who are perfusionists? And then ECMO specialists? Terrific. Terrific. And we have perfusionists that uh, um, have been, are still foundational with their ECMO techniques. So it's going to be talking a little bit in that primary area. And then we'll have some other things that when I travel around, uh, other content where perfusionists that have do, been doing ECMO for a while, maybe they haven't realized certain aspects about ECMO that they probably should bring back to their institutions and create change because there's a lot of issues and misunderstandings out there. Clear enough? Cool. Uh, so ECMO, again, so this is going to be foundational for some and, you know, boring for others, but it's a boring topic. ECMO physiology, that's kind of boring, you know, but hey, we'll make the best of it. So ECMO is the use of mechanical devices to support the heart and lung function in severe heart and lung failure. It's utilized in patients that are unresponsive to conventional care. Conventional care can often cause further damage, as Eric was pointing out, with our ventilators uh, settings, high ventilator settings, and excessive doses of vasopressors and vasoconstrictors. And we know, especially with vasoconstrictors, excessive doses, man, it can really just shut down the splanchnic bed, and you get a lot of problems there. Liver start, start functioning as well. The kidneys are shutting down. So ECMO provides a, an environment, a safer environment for the organs to heal avoiding consequences of high ventilator settings, of high pharmacology, of all the other things that we try uh, when the patient is starting to fail in their heart or lungs. Uh, kind of at the bottom here, again, I don't think the pointer works, but uh, on the right side here was our ECMO circuit in 1984. Uh, pieces and parts, uh, those, are older, those are as old as those that are as old as me. Remember the side med membrane, silicon membrane there? Uh, I think I stole this card from the laundry department, um, and it had these little wheels, and I know when we go through an elevator, it would almost like topple over, it was top heavy. So it was, uh, that was part of the, the ergonomics was not very good there as well. But I also had our um, uh, medical illustrator uh, do that circuit on the left side there uh, back in uh, 84. So you see the roller pump and the little bladder box and the bladder compliancy chamber. It's kind of cool historically to be around. But ECMO requires a thorough understanding of cardiopulmonary physiology. Um, sorry, I'm stepping around you here. Uh, physiology, pathophysiology, and ECMO physiology. So for those of us that aren't as used to it, on the left side there, uh, when we're on cardiopulmonary bypass for the most part, down in the op uh, open heart room or the uh, uh, cardiac uh, surgical arena, we are draining virtually 80 to 100% of the blood away from the patient at any one time, draining venous blood. And then we're giving it back to the, uh, bypassing the heart and the lungs and giving it back into the aorta up at the top there as arterialized blood. And therefore our monitor at the bottom left there doesn't show a pulse pressure because we're not really pulsing it in unless we have some kind of special equipment that we know that some companies have delved into. But we don't have any pulse pressure and we don't have any heart rate because we've shut the heart off with a drug formula called cardioplegia. That's the paralysis of the heart, high potassium, cold temperatures. Okay, on the right side though, with VA ECMO especially, uh, um, and DV, but in VA ECMO, we're only about, we're about 80, 70 to 80 percent of total output with ECMO. Now, we may be higher if the heart's not functioning or try to get there, but we actually don't mind that we have some pulsatility. Of course, we want an EKG if they have one uh, on VA ECMO, but it, we want some kind of pulsatility there because we don't want blood to be stagnant in the LV 
or in the lungs. You know, we want some pulsatility. We want the heart to be functioning in some way with VA ECMO. And a lot of this is going to depend on, as we'll see in our other speakers, how they're cannulated, how we can control this. But for the most part, we're shooting for 80% of the total cardiac output in VA ECMO but we do want that pulsatility to occur. And that way we can find out if the patient's deteriorating or improving as we turn down VA ECMO and up um, and let the heart and lungs take over on their own. Uh, ECMO versus ECLS, many of us have heard about it. On the left there, ECMO is uh, obviously extracorporeal membrane oxygenation where a pump system is usually used uh, but not always on pumpless ECMO. Uh, so there is a pumpless ECMO where there's a utilization of an artificial lung or oxygenator in the bottom of the left. What do you think propels the blood through that oxygenator? The blood pressure. You want more flow? You up the blood pressure. So a lot of this is still uh, research in some areas, but I know in Shreveport, LSU, maybe some of your centers that are using this. Uh, it's beautiful on patients that maybe a burn patient or an asthmatic patient. Uh, you don't need, you know, a tremendous amount of flow. The heart's working fine. And uh, so it's been used successfully. So I wanted to wanted you to realize that that could be ECMO. Now, on the other hand, ECLS is a more generalized term, meaning extracorporeal life support, where a pump system is definitely usually used, but it may or may not incorporate a lung or an artificial uh, uh, lung or an oxygenator like the ventricular assist devices. So ECLS, extracorporeal life support, would, uh, would, would include ECMO within its umbrella. So perfusion. Well, we have mostly perfusionists in here. So what is perfusion, really? Perfusion is a combination of respir uh, respiration and circulation. We can't have one without the other. And this becomes very, very important when we start looking to see how ECMO is intertwined with the body. So perfusion is respiration and circulation together. Um, of course, we don't have to tell too many people in here that uh, oxygen molecules and, uh, will come from the alveoli from the outside, uh, go through a, a partial pressure uh, gradient uh, from high to low. They'll diffuse across the interstitial space between the alveolus and the uh, capillary beds in the alveolus. And they will enter into the, uh, go from a high pressure, a high partial pressure to a lower partial pressure. And we'll have uh, oxygen and CO2 will be going in the reversed order. Uh, so molecular movement through diffusion gradients of partial pressures, partial pressure. Again, the pressure that would be exerted by just one of the gases in a mixture if it occupied the same volume on its own. So the more gases you have on there, the, the, it has to share that kind of space in there. So your partial pressures are going to change based on the number of gases you have in there. So party facts, on the alveolus, there are about 600 million lung sacs in your lungs. There are 1,490 miles of airway. That's like going from Chicago to Las Vegas. If you selected, um, if you stretched all the alveoli out, they would be about the size of four and a half 18 wheelers parked next to each other. Uh, kind of cool. Uh, what does this one say? The total surface area of lungs would be about the same uh, as a tennis court, a full tennis court. So it's a remarkable organ that uh, many of you that are respiratory therapists have more appreciation than even uh, some of the perfusionists do. So how do we integrate respiration, circulation, and consumption to achieve adequate tissue perfusion? That is what we're trying to achieve here, adequate tissue perfusion. Robin, would you say that with me? Adequate tissue perfusion. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Um, so we're going to hear this, about this in a little bit again. So what we have to do, we have to look at oxygen content, oxygen delivery, and oxygen consumption. So we know, most of us, all of us know a little bit of peat and repeat here. Oxygen content in the blood, there is a dissolved uh, uh, oxygen content in the plasma, which is not bound to the hemoglobin molecules. Now it's only about 1 to 3% of the total oxygen blood content within the blood. So it's very small. And the normal partial pressure of arterial blood oxygen is about 95 to 110 PO2. Uh, and the formula below it is uh, the partial pressure times a factor of 0.003, which is why it's so small, equals the dissolved oxygen. Interestingly, and I wouldn't recommend this on VA ECMO, if you have PO2s that are greater than 500 on VV ECMO, where you don't have to worry about supersaturated blood and maybe micro bubble coming out that we have all learned in perfusion school, if you're on VV ECMO, you can actually get up to 10% of dissolved oxygen in the blood, which may help if you really need the help uh, to begin with. But you have to interpret that you really need the help, and that's the focus of a lot of this lecture here. 
the bound oxygen to hemoglobin, about 98% of oxygen is bound. And it's, as you know, uh, there's four heme sites associated with each normal hemoglobin molecule. Surprisingly, many people think that's per one red blood cell. Nope, per hemoglobin molecule. So how many hemoglobin molecules are in a red blood cell? Oh, by the way, the, in the bound sat, uh, oxygen, the saturation, we go by saturation. All the heme sites are bound with oxygen. It's 100% saturated. And your formula is there that many of you have seen uh, probably before. You can look up again. So the oxygen content is the number of oxygen molecules in the blood. So if we took the dissolved calculation plus what's bound to hemoglobin, that gives us the content, the CaO2. Uh, why do you need to know this? Because if you're going to take some of these certification exams or whatever, some of these formulas are going to come up again. Uh, you just kind of got to kind of keep that in mind. So it's the content, uh, in this case, of the arterial blood of oxygen. Calculations will mostly include the hemoglobin bound oxygen molecules since 98% of that is, uh, what, is what's going on there. The bottom left for the arrow is each red blood cell contains several hundred million hemoglobin molecules per uh, which transport oxygen. Did you all know that? Any of you? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I've read. I was kind of surprised too. I said, that many? So again, it's not four sites on a red blood cell. There's several hundred million hemoglobin molecules, which then have the four sites where oxygen are bound to it. Isn't that interesting? So when we're looking at oxygen delivery then from the blood to the tissue, uh, where again, we're going with perfusion, uh, partial pressure diffusion gradients, where oxygen is going to diffuse off the hemoglobin or from the dissolved oxygen across the interstitial fluid into the tissues of the body uh, to, uh, to uh, generate uh, nutrients and energy. And same with the CO2, the metabolites that are coming across and going the other way on their high to low partial pressure gradient and getting back into the plasma to, be, um, to go back to the lungs and be exhaled. Each cell contains hundreds of thousands, oh, this is kind of cool too, each cell, so the tissue cell over there, the blue is the nucleus, each uh, cell contains hundreds to thousands of mitochondria which are located in the fluid that surrounds the nucleus, which is called the cytoplasm by the way. Almost no DNA is packaged in chromosomes within the nucleus. Mitochondria have a, just a small amount of their own DNA, which is kind of interesting. Okay. So we have the oxygen delivery chain, and uh, believe me, we're getting somewhere with this. So let's take the atmosphere. We're breathing in 21% uh, oxygen at a partial pressure of about 159 millimeters on a given 760 millimeter atmospheric day. Once it gets into the alveolar, into the lungs, it gets humidified and there's water vapor. Remember what I say when other molecules are getting in there, then the, you start losing that partial pressure of that one gas because they're all sharing the space in there. So because of the dead space that Eric had talked about and the humidified vapor, we drop from 159 to 149 for a given PO2 within the alveoli. Uh, once it goes into the capillary levels of the alveoli, it actually, the PO2 is dropped to 75 to 110 millimeters mercury. Once it gets in the left atrium, because of the pulmonary shunt, which in the bronchial veins, which they call the uh, pulmonary venous admixture, the actual PO2 now in the left atrium has dropped to 95 from that, that 159. So this is the chain. Once it's in the arterial blood, about 95 millimeters of mercury. That's about what we're normally, uh, what our PO2 is. Now, it really, because of the many different pathways it's taking and diversion, and it's using up some of its own oxygen as well, the blood is, uh, the capillary beds, the actual uh, PO2 is about 35 to 40 in the capillary beds. Once it gets into the tissue, tissue interstitium, or that middle area, before it's actually going into the cell, I just like to make the camera go back and forth, you know, but I haven't danced that much yet. Uh, once it gets into there, look how much it's dropped, down to 18 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Now, it gets intracellular, so it's getting within the yellow on the, on the far right there, the circle there, and the cytosol of the cell, which is outside, which is intracellular, uh, but outside the mitochondrial nuclei, about 10 to 14, so there's a huge drop right there. You know, it gets down to get into the mitochondria where it's needed to create energy, it's only about one to eight millimeters of mercury. So it's dropped from 159 out here all the way down to about one to eight, average around four to five. So where is this going to come into play? With oxygen delivery, John, will you give me like the five minute thing? Because the time was different. I had my alarm set. Thanks. Here, give me 10 minute thing. Uh, what are we now? Uh, let's see. 
That's fine. <laughs> cardiac pulmonary, uh, so in cardiac pulmonary bypass, cardiac output or VA ECMO, the blood flow requirements, as I said earlier, is about 80 to 100% systemic blood flow. So we're delivering, oxygen delivery is known as the DO2, capital D, O2, okay, delivery. Again, these are on your certification tests. The delivery formula is the content of the oxygen times the, either the cardiac output or the VA ECMO or a combination of the two to give you how much delivery of oxygen to the tissues. So the flows that we design as perfusionists, as you know, uh, vary between the populations with the neonates, the pediatrics, and adults based on size and also metabolic need. Uh, so our adults about 60 to 80 cc's per kilo per minute on our VA ECMO with about a 2.2 to 2.4 uh, index body surface area. Now, metabolism is the, where oxygen and substrates are provided to the tissues, producing heat, energy, carbon dioxide, and water. There's where our mitochondria is coming up. So metabolism is closely related to the consumption of the body. Remember that. And it's determined by the direct measurement of oxygen content of oxygen consumed per minute from our tissues. The oxygen, and this is hugely important, the oxygen availability in the bloodstream is normally five times the amount actually used by our tissue. Five times, pretty conservative. So that only 20 to 25% of oxygen is removed under normal condition, which is the reason we have venous sats normally between 65 and 75%. Cool? So the consumption, again, cardiac output, uh, or the consumption then formula would be, total consumption would be the cardiac output times the content of the AVO2 difference. Uh, so you could say 100% minus uh, 75 sat, 25% times a factor of 10 will give you the consumption. It's a function of metabolizing cell mass. Each organ system has different metabolic means based on cell mass and cellular activity, and it's controlled by the thyroid, catecholamines, and hypothalamus. What I want you to see here, and I'll move my cameraman over to this side, is on this little chart here, we can see that uh, a good percentage of the uh, blood flow is actually through the splanchnic uh, bed and the kidney of the total cardiac output. But if we look at uptakes, uh, there's a huge uptake of the splanchnic bed. Again, those low to organs I was worried about when given so much phase of pressures, but the brain has a fairly significant amount, even though it's not getting a high percentage of the cardiac output. Well, why is this? The brain does not store glycogen well. Therefore, the concentration is very low and must be replenished continuously through aerobic energy me metabolism. So if it had a lot of glycogen, like other, other cells in our body or muscle cells, then it could go into anaerobic and use glucose as an energy source rather than relying on oxygen or an aerobic type of metabolism. In oxygen consumption, uh, decreased it can be decreased by hypothermia, paralysis, hypothyroidism, or increased by seizures, sepsis, hyperthermia, inflammation, exercise. Now, these are just some values that are normals. For oxygen content of, of the arterial blood, it's about 20 cc's per deciliter. In the venous, the content is about 16 cc's per deciliter. So for an average consumption or AVDO2 difference, we have a four by four, so 20 minus 16 equals four cc's per deciliter. The delivery of oxygen within a system, whether it's ECMO or our own bodies or whatever, is about 600 cc's per minute per meter squared. And the consumption in the average adult, consumption, again, by the tissue, is about 120 cc's per minute per meter squared, three cc's per kilo per minute, or 250 to 300 cc's per minute, um, just different values, different variations. And we'll see how, why this becomes important here. So. Again, remember that five to one ratio of delivery to consumption. So the DO2, the delivery to the consumption ratio is normally about five to one. Remember that. Again, remember it, five to one. Okay, so if we increase consumption within the body, we have to increase our blood flow. That makes sense, the heart rate goes up, you know, and whatever. Uh, or we have to, have to increase the oxygen content of the blood. Okay, or the dissociation curve, which we're not gonna go over here, but it shifts right, uh, would allow the shift to the right where you would allow more oxygen to have less affinity for hemoglobin to be released easier to the tissues. Now, the body will tolerate this well until the ratio decreases below that ratio of two to one. So we're safe 
generally from five to one all the way down to about two to one before we start going into having issues. The metabolism under a two to one ratio will then switch from aerobic to anaerobic processes. And what we'll see, and I don't have to tell you guys this, we'll see a lower venous saturation. We'll see a higher degree of lactic acid production rather than CO2, which is uh, the metabolite from aerobic mechanisms. We'll see our base deficits increasing. And we'll see a systemic acidosis. And eventually, the systemic acidosis will lead to uh, resulting organ failure, multi-organ failure. So another way to look at this curve, and this is, comes out of the Red Book, and I think Dr. Bartlett had actually done this, we see our uh, delivery on our x-axis, our uh, consumption on the y-axis, and we see our ratio on the line on the right, 80%, 5 to 1 ratio. And even if we're hypermetabolic, we can maintain uh, a pretty normal, healthy type of individual. Once we get below that 2 to 1 or 50% uh, saturation, now we may get into shock and start changing over to the anaerobic mechanisms where you would see those deleterious effects that we just mentioned. So aerobic respiration is 19 times more effective at releasing energy than anaerobic respiration. Aerobic processes ex extract most of the stored energy from ATP, that's when our oxygen went to our mitochondria, utilizing oxygen and glucose interaction. The anaerobic process leaves most of the ATP generating sor uh, sources in like waste products such as lactate. In humans then, we all probably know this, or some of our athletes, aerobic processes are used for extreme and sustained efforts. You know, if I take off real fast, I need something real quick. They'll be used for a short period of time until I switch over into aerobic mechanisms. You've been on that treadmill for a while and all of a sudden, oh, I'm starting to breathe a little easier now. You know, now you've switched over to a more aerobic, more efficient type of energy me uh, mechanism uh, with exercise. Aerobic processes produce up to 38 ATP per glucose molecule, where an anaerobic yields only 2 ATP per glucose molecule. So the efficiency is quite different. The anaerobic process is not fully combustible, leaving higher lactate levels. Lactate is one of the substances, substances produced by the cells as the body turns food into energy. So it's basically lactic acid minus one protein. Lactate is the chief end product of anaerobic muscle metabolism, increasing the acidity of the tissue to the point where function is sacrificed. Now, tell me how many minutes we have. Yeah, 19. 19. Normal, yeah, because the time thing was way. Normal values uh, in the range with lactate, and this is really important for those of you that are either getting into ECMO, you should do lactates occasionally, a couple times a day, at least once a day. I would, I would prefer more. Probably no more than, less, than four hours, every four hours, but I think lactates really kind of tell a nice story. The normal values are between 0.5 and 1.5, in our normal critical ill patients that are not on ECMO, they're generally below two millimoles per liter. But those of us that uh, know ECMO, uh, that the patient's been in a, uh, uh, an organ dysfunction, heart, lung, uh, a perfusion type dysfunction, and they're put on ECMO to save their lives, man, their lactates can be greater than 10, 12, 16. Who's seen one higher than that and the person lived? What's the number? Machine blew up. <laughs> yeah, extremely, extremely high. But you get that acidosis, you get that organ dysfunction. Uh, what's interesting though, when you go on ECMO with some of these patients, you may see the lactates be pretty high, 12. That's why you went on, right? And because of washout, so you're going on pump, and you're washing some of that lactate out, it's not just gonna minimize quickly, and the liver's probably not working well because of the acidosis. So you can actually see the acidosis or the lactate levels go up on ECMO for the first 12 to 24 hours because of the washout. The lungs, I mean, the liver is what metabolizes the uh, lactate, and if it's not functioning, you know, what we're hoping to do is get that washout, give it time, it's not because we're not delivering enough oxygen, it's because of the washout, right? and then have it level off. Once it's leveled off and it stays high, I'm actually pretty happy if everything else is looking good. My venous sats and you know, my pH is normalized and everything. But it's not until the liver starts neutralizing it where it starts to come down again. So it may take a few days. So some people think, well, we're on ECMO. We must be hypoxic because you know, our PO2 is on VV ECMO, which we're gonna get into in a second. So therefore, you have to remember that those numbers will probably go up before they go down. I'm not gonna get into the different kind of cannulations because we have two excellent speakers that'll talk, uh, that'll talk more about that. But the type of cannulation will certainly 
um, describe or give you the idea of how much uh, ECMO uh, control you have on the patient's systemic circulation. Uh, for time-wise, I, I believe uh, Bridge is going to go over this, but the advantages of VA ECMO, it augments the cardiac output of the native heart, systemic blood flow increases, increases oxygen delivery through blood flow and oxygen content, she'll go over this more later, improves systemic blood pressure with higher flows through the resistance of the blood vessel, and it's, it reduces preload. We're taking from venous, putting back in the arterial. Disadvantages is it's invasive cannulation to the arterial system, so if you do have microbubbles, you know, or something, you know, you're going right into the systemic circulation, unlike VV ECMO. Uh, you may have increased the left ventricular afterload depending on uh, how you cannulate it, and you can cause pulmonary edema, uh, edema if the LV is not unloaded, like an LDV dysfunction in competent aortic valve. So what we do is when we're going to go on VA ECMO, we choose the expected flow rate, maybe 80%. Uh, if it's, uh, um, mostly it's going to be cardiac if we're going on VA, VA ECMO, but there are some that will go on VA for respiratory. But we'll choose 80% uh, systemic output. Uh, if the heart's not working at all, maybe we'll go a little bit bigger. And we, we choose the circuit components to meet the maximum flow, again, that 80%. And we're trying to shoot for at least a DO2 to VO2 ratio of 3 to 1 in that safe zone. Not 5 to 1, well, it could be 5 to 1, but if we can get the 3 to 1, we're in that safe zone, greater than 3 to 1. So we should see, achieve arterial sats that are greater than 90 and venous sats around 65. Uh, and then we will assure, uh, assure cardiac improvement by echocardiography on VA ECMO. This is what you would normally see a picture of, your blood gases possibly on VA ECMO, where you see a nice pH, PO2 110. Uh, I got a 95 pulse ox over there. This is an Edwards uh, machine that can kind of go off blood pressure and tell you what, approximate what your cardiac output is. So fairly nice gas being on VA ECMO. Lactate level's still a little high, but we're early in the run. Now, in veno veno ECMO, though, we drain and reinfuse the blood in the venous system only. We don't even touch the arterial system. Okay, most of us know that here. Uh, again, they're going to go over cannulation later, but there's two ways to cannulate. There's a two-site and a one-site cannulation. But basically, we're draining from the venous blood and we're putting back into the venous, I'm sorry, we're draining the venous blood and putting back arterial blood into the venous system in VV ECMO. The ECMO oxygenated perfusate is returned to the venous circulation. Mixes with, it mixes with the systemic cir venous circulation returning from the organs. I'm just going to tell you now, we're only about 60% flow is all we really need with VV ECMO generally. So a lot of the blood will bypass those cannulas and go into the heart. So you'll get like a purple blood meeting the arterial, uh, a blue blood meeting the arterial blood going in the right side, being a purple blood and being somewhat lower of a saturation and lower PO2, which we'll talk about. Oxygenated blood mixing with the deoxygenated venous blood mixing in the right side of the heart, like I said. Result is a partially oxygenated blood product ejected from the left ventricle. So we're getting a partially oxygenated blood product ejecting from the left ventricle. Do we need the heart to work in VV ECMO? Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. On VA ECMO, not so much. So really in VV ECMO, it only requires about 60% of systemic arterial blood flow. Trust me on that. Uh, so oftentimes we calculate it like a VAD. We calculate it like a VAD, like we need to have 80, 90%. But really, it only requires, if you're doing this correctly, about 60%. So you can get away with a little smaller cannula. But it's most important to understand the DO2 to VO2 ratios, which is often misunderstood. Again, I, I threw those formulas down there, uh, but you can look this up again. Now the, now, the huge difference, misunderstanding sometimes, is what is hypoxemia? Hypoxemia, basically, is just the decreased oxygen content in the blood. It's a relative term. Where, what's the number? I don't know, it's, but it's hypoxemic. Hypoxia, on the other hand, is inadequate oxygen supply to meet tissue demands. So hypoxia relies on the content, relies on the delivery, and rely on uh, and, and it uh, relies and it's dependent on high consumption. So you can have hypoxemic blood that we consider hypoxemic, but not be hypoxic. So hypoxemia does not take into account the systemic blood flow and or ECMO flow. All it's talking about is the content, not the flow. Very important. Lot, uh, I'm going to show you a few quick formulas. Uh, I would suggest that chapter four of the Red Book goes into this with a whole lot more detail. And you can read it probably 10 times. I probably read it about 30 times. And uh, there's something, there's, every sentence has something really cool about it to learn more about this kind of thing. Because these are the formulas you're going to be using that, that you can actually con um, calculate content when you have two flows, ECMO flow and anatomical flow. 
So the formulas are in the Red Book, Chapter 4. Um, and in those formulas, you can either use content or sats in the formula, but not partial pressure. So uh, if you want to get more into the VO2 to, uh, DO2 to VO2 ratios, uh, definitely look into that. So here's a blood gas on a VV patient. Pulse ox, 85. PH 742, PO2 55, PCO2 44, on and on and on. Is there a problem? Oh, the Red Book, I'm sorry. The Red Book is like, uh, it's like this big. It's the Bible uh, for ECMO. ELSO puts it out. Okay, okay. it can be bought, Perfusion.com bookstore can be bought there, it can be bought through ELSO. It's in its uh, fifth, fifth edition right now. Uh, so it's pretty up to date. Um, so anyway, the Red Book, yeah, sorry about that. Also organization. So is this a bad blood gas? For VV ECMO? For VV ECMO? So our ECMO specialist says no. Our perfusionist said, I don't know, I don't want to say anything. Yes, ask the ECMO specialist. Is that a bad blood gas in your center? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, 55 PO2, 85 pulse ox. So a lot of people would say that patient's hypoxic. It's not like VA ECMO. We don't have that 110 millimeters mercury. We don't have, you know, but hey, the venous sat's 72. Poxol is 85. That's lower than we normally see on VA. But when we do the, and, but look, the base deficit's fine. The pH is fine. When we actually do the DO2 to VO2 ratio, 3.64, more than adequate. But you'll get so many physicians and providers that'll tell you that patient's hypoxic because they may be hypoxemic, maybe not, but they're hypoxic, no, there's no signs of that. Lactate's not rising. Again, DO2 to VO2 ratio, that's what we're going for. And then those other things with venous sats and base deficits and all that. So the pulse oximeter read 83%, the PO2 is 55, the clinician feels not enough, uh, this is a vicious down cycle, the clinician feels ECMO not delivering enough oxygen. Uh, so what we do as clinicians, you've seen this in your centers, ECMO specialists, what we do is um, the doctors say, man, they're hypoxic. We increase the VV flow by turning up the re revolutions per minute on the centrifugal or the roller pump. Get more blood flow. That makes sense, right? If we want to go ahead and increase oxygenation if we think they're hypoxic. So what then happens is we create a higher negative pressure in the venous line because we're draining from the venous line and we, the vessel collapses down like that was shown beautifully yesterday on the video. And we get chugging occurs or the venous vessel collapses onto the drainage canyon. We start to get chugging intermittently. So, you know, and that's, that creates all kinds of problems with hemolysis and protein denaturation and, and all that. But the, basically the vessels of the walls, the vessel walls are collapsing right down on the cannula and that's chugging. Uh, but so we'll visualize and assure that there's adequate venous cannula placement. Did it move? Did it migrate? No, we're fine. Uh, but now we say, oh, the patient must be hypovolemic intravascularly. They must be low on volume intravascularly. So the specialist is told, or they go on their own, they infuse a lot of volume. Uh, probably not good as saline, but uh, like we heard yesterday, albumin's good, you know, red blood cells if we need it. And the chugging stops. Per nap, and then the chugging stops because now we've increased the CVP, we've stopped the chugging or the vessel wall is collapsing for known RPMs on the pump, and perhaps we can now turn up the flow to get more PO2 because we're still unhappy with that. Now, we, I was happy with it, but they weren't happy with it because that DO2, VO2 was, was fine. We get a gas like this then after they do that. Yeah, the ECMO flow went up to 4.5 from 4. We stopped the chugging, but all of a sudden, the values just drop like crazy, and we won't go over them, but look at the PO2, look at the saturation, look at the cardiac output, nine liters per minute. So we have more venous blood mixing with the arterial blood with a little bit more ECMO blood flow at that time, delivering a more hypox uh, hypoxemic blood now that we've given all this volume. Uh, if I had more time, we'd get more into detail with that, but then all of a sudden over that shift, they gave a liter and a half because they felt like that was the right thing to do to get our ECMO flow up. Uh, it actually went from the left side to the right side, consolidation, so our gases got worse. So even on the ventilator settings that Eric was describing, the lower settings, we, it was, we weren't getting as good a gas exchange with the pulmonary edema that we had created. And in this case, actually, if you do the numbers, the DO2, VO2 was below two, by the way. So even though we went on, up on ECMO flow, we went down on our ratio. So we made it worse for ourselves. Does it, the decision that more ECMO blood flow is needed to meet metabolic demand may have been incorrect. Yes, it was. And I see this a lot when I go to different centers, by the way. The decision causes the ECMO specialist to increase pump flow RPMs. Um, that then new chugging required more intravascular volume. That was the thinking. Uh, the decision to provide higher blood flow, but clinician was still not satisfied with, satisfied with adequacy of perfusion. Uh, so they, because they were so fixated on a pulse ox and a patient arterial O2, 
That's just part of the story. That's either a capillary O2 right there or it's an arterial O2 there. But that's not saying whether or not we're adequately perfusing the body. That's what venous stats are for, right? Are we adequately perfusing the tissue? That's where that delivery to consumption ratio comes into play. This is the decision to increase RPMs and flow, chugging occurred on pump with the only pressure uh, within the venous line, minus 100. Decision to infuse even more volume, which increased the CVP, increased the venous capacitance, increased the native cardiac output. Not really good things because we didn't need to in the first place. Then we decide, oh, now we've got to go ahead and say, hey, Eric, can you go ahead and increase the ventilator settings because we're just not doing enough on ECMO here. You know? So now you're getting into the problems that he talked about. And then the big decision, oh, let's just go ahead and get invasive and an anticoagulated patient and add another venous cannula so we can get even more ECMO flow. All these decisions happened, but they didn't need to in the first place. We got two minutes, one minute. Oh, you're cutting me off. <laughs> yeah, we got. Uh, so in sepsis, I just want to say in sepsis, we had some good talks on this yesterday. Capillary beds open their pores and allow passage of free water to the extravascular space. Proteins may pass if, if, pass if the sepsis is severe enough. That's where we get all of our systemic edema. I want you, as I mentioned yesterday, it's not just, and Eric might have mentioned, it's not just the interstitium or the sub-Q. It's every organ in the body is going to go through dysfunction because of the uh, increase in uh, uh, volume load of the patient. So it's more difficult for the oxygen transfer and tissue delivery, uh, which is multi-organ function, dysfunction, increased mortality. And it's because we're increasing the barrier space there between what, I, like I said, the blood or the tissues. So it requires a higher PO2 and you're not getting the transfer to come across. So uh, you'll get a, a worse issue. Plus the dilutional component of giving all that volume. Bad, 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 bad. So had the decision maker looked at the other parameters such as DO2 to VO2 ratios, venous sat, PO2s, venous sats, base deficits, lactate levels, as well as perhaps none of these decisions would have been implemented. I just wanted to show you again what the normal venous, venous ECMO, veno, veno ECMO flow is. You don't need to be as high as you think you are. This hospital up in Lima actually has this board in every patient's room. And look right in the middle column there. They actually have their DO2, VO2 calculated from the computer. They write it down and they write the ratio right below it. We need to start focusing on that, man, not the pulse ox and the PO2. Uh, another quick trick, and I have two slides, and then you can really cut me off the cane, is that we have uh, another, and this comes from Dr. Uh, Dr. Bartlett as well, uh, Red Book, it'll be in the Red Book, that we know that we, you know, we're trying to achieve 5046, you know, liters per minute. Well, we may not have that venous cannula size to get that kind of drainage, right? Or we have an arterial uh, 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 cannula in the venous system that can't deliver that kind of flow. But if we just go ahead and increase the hemoglobin, okay, we're giving some homologous red blood cells. We increase it. Now, for, to, to offer the same amount of oxygen delivery at 240 cc's per minute, we don't have to have as high a flow which is why Dr. Bartlett is a, a proponent of higher hematocrits on VV ECMO, because you have more content, therefore you don't need as much delivery because the content's there and, and that'll, that'll solve the problem. You just don't have to give all kinds of fluids to get such high flow. One thing I brought up yesterday, but I uh, didn't agree with all our panelists yesterday, is there is some research going into now whether a dual lumen at too high of flows can actually dilate the right ventricle because of the kinetic energy. Uh, they didn't agree with it yesterday, but I think uh, somebody pointed out a paper to me that just came out. So we need to look for that. So another reason to maybe stay lower on the flows. I'll stop there. Happy Mardi Gras a couple weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs>